Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Agile Leadership Bites. I'm Daniel Gagnon, and I'm joined as always by Bruno Cadet, and together we are Agile Leader Academy. Today's 30-minute topic, from PMO to VMO, how do we get to a value management office, a fairly new concept, and how do we connect strategy to execution? So without further ado, let's begin by clarifying what we mean by a PMO. The PMI came out in March of this year with a study which conducted with uh, McKinsey uh, worldwide to try and clarify what actually is uh, lies behind the term PMO in organizations around the world. And they found several different nomenclatures. Uh, you can see the percentages here as well. And obviously they add up to more than 100 because many organizations have several of these types of, of entities within them. What we're talking about, product management offices, project management offices, program, uh, program management offices, strategy, uh, project support, centers of excellence, change management offices, etc. So in, in this presentation, when we refer to a PMO, it could be any or none or all of these, depending on uh, the unique situation each organization uh, faces. So the first thing we want to point out is, and this is news to no one, uh, all of these PMOs have been under pressure for quite some time, and the dedicated professionals who work in them have been sometimes feeling like they're running for their lives amidst all the transformations, the digital transformations, the agile transformations, et cetera. And um, this is a widespread phenomenon. So we're definitely in, in, in times of, of deep change. And the reason we're, in, we're facing these changes, obviously, the acceleration of change, the acceleration of com uh, competition, et cetera. And the structures that we're looking at um, aren't necessarily set up to deal well with us. Let's look, with, look at the first familiar design that most of you will immediately recognize. Uh, these PMOs, basically, uh, in, in this first example, are merely implementers of strategy, which is ladder, elaborated by some form of upper management echelon or, or deciding entity. So there's a disconnect between strategy and execution here because the strategy is in one box and execution is trickled down to another box. A variation on this theme in larger organizations, multiple PMOs, sometimes divisional, sometimes line of business, but again, implementing strategy elaborated by an upper management echelon. And it gets even worse in organizations that we've seen, and I'm sure you have as well. We have these business PMOs following a PMLC or project management lifecycle sort of being shadowed by IT, so-called IT PMOs, which are following a systems development life cycle. Uh, obviously the governance gets very complex, the artifacts multiply, the signal to noise ratio gets very, uh, very weak, et cetera. So all of these current familiar designs were basically built for different times. All right, so. The approaches we just saw with the trickling down from upper management into various rivulets that go down into multiple PMOs, et cetera. Well, uh, these approaches were built for different times, right? And they certainly are not for today's speed of change. And as we clearly see now, nor tomorrow's. So how do we start thinking about moving from these PMOs to the concept, concept of a VMO? And we'll going to explain that thoroughly. So. Upgrading the PMO to a VMO, a value management office, is a step in the right direction, but we're going to see it's beyond an upgrade. It's not just um, you know, a, a, a firmware swap. Because a VMO, a true VMO, will need to, you know, will, will need to bridge both what uh, Henry Mintz uh, calls the slabs, basically the hierarchical levels, and the functional silos, which we're all familiar with of the organization. So a VMO really should gather executive team members, major governance stakeholders, value stream managers. Um, and I, we could add to this, you know, anyone, anyone um, in charge of enterprise architecture, all the corporate stakeholders who have a say in how the organization is designed and functions, we need to somehow get them collaborating in a single entity. And that entity needs to be able to analyze, select, and prioritize the work of the entire enterprise, which is was reserved so far for an upper management um, conclave, which, which prioritized. Uh, and the reason to do that is you, you want a constant combined strategic operational cycle that's really supported to client needs at the speed that the client needs them, not big year upfront planning, 
that trickles down the rivulets as we saw again. So how do you make that transition? How do you make that happen? So uh, Bruno here came up with something we call the Agile Transformation Canvas. And Bruno, you want to, uh, uh, I'll let you explain um, your canvas. Yes, sure. This is actually a tool we came up, we came up with uh, to really illustrate and help people visualize where we are today, where we want to go. It can be used for any type of transformation, but it has been very useful specifically for transition from different MOs like PMOs to VMO. And the, the tool is very simple, but powerful. So there are like three dimensions here. On the horizontal, you see the scale, which is the organizational scale, what we talk about. This is something that is more local, one function, all the way to the whole enterprise. In between, you have projects, multidisciplinary team, value stream, and so on. On the vertical axis, you got impact. Is it just the ways of working, the tools or methods? Or does it go all the way to the DNA organization, like culture, leadership, vision, or something in between, governance, management processes? So we can, thanks to that, really see what is the territory of the entity we are uh, discussing, right? And the third dimension is the benefit. Depending on where you are in terms of scale impact, there are some kind of benefits that you can realistically expect. Daniel, if you can uh, make the benefits appear. So for example, at low level is en engagement, like project ways of working, uh, you can start to accelerate um, uh, the delivery of value, services and products then adaptability of the organization. And finally, at the top level, with a really culture change and enterprise scale, then you can talk about anticipation. You're not just, uh, you become a disruptor, you can innovate and so on. And that's very important because in many transformations that we've seen transitions, including to our VMO, often we don't uh, have the, um, a strong uh, link between uh, the how and the, and, the, and and what we can achieve. For example, if someone says I have small PMO somewhere, project level with working, and we're going to like oh become an adaptable organization, become a disruptor, it's just not realistic. So, so this 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 arrow there benefits is critical to see to 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 visualize and explore that the the um, uh, what we're talking about can actually achieve this kind of benefits. Can we move to the next one, Daniel. Mm -hmm. That's a simple example that will really help you to understand the power of this canvas before uh, using it specifically for our, our topic today. Uh, many years ago, Daniel and I have been involved in, with many different types of organizations and uh, including uh, Agile Center of Excellence or Agile Center Centers of Expertise. And often we had some kind of frictions because here typically uh, the different people in the transformation team, what they had in mind, that they want simply uh, to get agile coaches for their projects, like project starts, and they want to choose agile coach to have the project being, being delivered in an iterative, iterative and incremental way. Okay, so we're really at the project level, ways of working, tools, methods, Scrum, and so on. Next, Daniel. However, among agile specialists and experts, we're talking about, among each other. Oh, we're going to change the whole organization, right? We're going to have the Spotify model where we're going to have stripes, server leadership at the management level, and, and so on. And see, you, you can see here that we have very different visions of what we are uh, uh, targeting. And the thing is, for years, we can discuss and use the same words like agile, project management, transformation, management, and so on. And everyone is nodding to each other. But actually, we, we are meaning different things, different meaning. So. It's just a word salad. In order to see what actually these words mean, we need a tool such as that, so that people can gather together and see and, and draw what they, what, what they have in mind when they say agile transformation, when they say PM, PMO, when, when they say VMO, for example. And it's a very powerful tool because uh, it can really help to visualize together where we are and where we're going to. So let's like take a look at how a VMO, putting up, a, you know, creating a VMO could help this situation. So let's just clear away some of the, uh, the visual background here. We still have the canvas, right? So usually we have, again, the players, I mean, we've presented a few players, the executive committee, which, you know, the, the upper management determining the strategy. You have the product and project teams, which are more in their local one function ways of working. 
compliance regulatory and you know regulatory and industry governance is has a word to say uh, usually you have a transformation office, be it digital, agile, or change management. And in the middle, you usually have some cord, some kind of XMO. So as you can see, all these players are at different levels, uh, you know, and pursuing impact and scale in a much far different way. So near the twain shall meet, uh, basically. So uh, what we have, uh, the model we need to move towards, let's just get rid of the noise here. Let's start from the center. What a VMO needs to do in order to be an actual improvement is to capture the benefits in the scale and the impact from the upper right-hand quadrants. That is your VMO. It's a single entity for strategy, prioritization, adaptive governance, and execution. What happens then is all the other players are actually part and stakeholder and contributors, and they make up the, the, the VMO, basically. Now, this image with everything nice and tight in a little box here is, is kind of interesting, but it's a seductive diagram, but it too is wrong. Let's just tweak this for a reality check. And what you really should wind up with is something whereby, yes, everyone participates in a centralized VMO, but each of these entities also have their own jurisdiction their own job to do except that now as reality becomes more like this the vmo and this is important is not an all-powerful central bureaucracy what it is is a nexus of cross-functional decision making where everything is transparent decisions are shared and things are brought to light and there's a unity of purpose that is fostered it is not a central bureaucracy that is a pmo on steroids controlling everything and taking away basically agency or responsibility from the rest of the organization, including the teams, right? So it's a very difficult balance and it takes years to evolve towards this, but this is the picture you need to keep in mind. And by achieving or moving towards something similar like this, you will get to emergent strategy rather than the big you know, mind dump at the beginning of the year, right? Because you have unity of purpose. So you can adopt that emergent approach to strategy. It's no longer fire and forget basically, because you're talking all year round, right? So you get to the adaptive portfolio, basically. So it covers a wide risk profile because the government folks are there, the teams are there, the transformation, everyone's there. It's co-created and prioritized within the VMO, not just at the upper level. It includes short and long-term initiatives. It might even include some exploratory initiatives which are treated differently. And it uses multiple criteria, cost of delay, risk of doing and not doing, available skills, capability to deliver. It institutes work and process levels at the portfolio level by the transparency. And let's just look at a situation that only a VMO like this could handle. Here we have a typical multi-project um, organization and the people are all contributors. All these people, these are like Andrew, Mike, uh, Simon, Jorge and, uh, and, and, and Juliette, they're all working partially on all these five projects because that's the way the, you know, the resource utilization is working, right? So how do, we, how do we move away from, how do we get an improvement from that? Because this is massive multitasking. Look at, because you're always waiting for work, very little green time. If we just had the ability to work across the silos, across the functions, across everyone, a PMO alone, a traditional PMO alone, would not have the authority to say, okay, um, Antoinette and George are going to work on project one and they're more dedicated and so on. What we have here is the same number of people, the same number of projects, but because we had a centralized collaborative entity able to talk across the silos and basically render obvious the, the, the gain in work time here. And let me just illustrate this, let's just take this away. Same projects, same people, but because we're talking at a VMO level, there's a lot more work being done. It's as easy as that. And there's, we have data to back that up, which I'll show you in a minute. So basically the first steps towards a VMO, right? We just saw that, you know, there's studies that say that if you're on five projects at once, if you're contributing to five projects, 80% of your day is context switching is waste. May as well stay home and not even turn the computer on because you're, you're not contributing very much anywhere, right? If we look at also the cost of, and this is, this is old data, but it's still visually, it's very uh, clear here that 
ramping up and ramping projects down as opposed to bringing the work to the teams, look at the white space. I mean, same people, same organization, hardly any white space to get the work done with multiple ramp up and ramp downs. A lot more white space when you're going again a capacity driven uh, way. But you can't go capacity driven just with the PMO deciding or just with the functions deciding. You need that unity of purpose, basically. So uh, to wrap all this up, involve all levels of the organization to get to that VMO structure. Proceed by invitation. It can't be a centralized bureaucracy that appears all of a sudden with top-down heavy change management and you know posters. That will not work. Uh, capitalize on the skills in the current PMO, but also uh, those people need to understand that what will emerge from this will not be a traditional PMO. Foster transparency and trust. Invitation, you know, do open spaces, just do whatever you need to, to move away from traditional top-down change management. And acknowledge that this journey will take time. This can take anywhere from two to 15 years to achieve, depending on the size of the organization. But if you embark on the journey, the benefits will start showing up very quickly. And you'll be surprised. And we've worked with clients with this approach many times. It is a not an easy thing to do, but it is a necessary thing to do. And that is it for our part of it. We have some, um, well, we're on LinkedIn here, so you, you guys already know how to reach us. Um, there's some resources here. This will all be available, it'll be recorded. Basically, there's an actual book called From PMO to VMO, which uh, touches upon many of these, uh, many of these aspects. Um, as well as the uh, the PMO the the PMI uh, study, um, and that's it. Uh, questions and c concerns, comments, challenges. It's the first time I I actually read the acronym VMO. PMO I'm familiar with, and PMO is <clears throat> part of the language. But VMO, uh, I the presentation is very clear. I understand the value of it. But um, of, of such a thing as a VMO, that would be an evolved company, something that would have already crossed quite a few uh, culture shocks, let's say. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we're not talking about companies who don't even have a PMO yet, although in some cases that might be easier <laughs> because they wouldn't have to unlearn, uh, you know, unlearn the PMO step. And when you talk about culture, Francois, it's interesting because what are going to you is are the obstacles culturally? Because you talk about the process and the entity, the structure. What does it mean culturally? What do you think? What are the obstacles? I think much of the culture just grows uh, from how things are done. When you first join a company, unless it's a company you're starting from the ground up. Uh, when you join a company, you come in with a certain focus and a certain way, a habit of doing things. Agile uh, introduces... Uh, a desire for change, and it proposes something that I've seen firsthand, which had uh, benefits. But I also saw firsthand the daily uh, frictions because, well, that's not how you do things. Agile is fine so long as it helps you do what it is you do better. Um, doing something new entirely that you have no focus for. So if you extend that to the concept of value, that's why I find, you know, everyone would agree that the graphic it's, you can't debate that. It makes sense. It will, it will go to faster and more um, internalized uh, decision making. Yeah, it's great. However, each and every one of those spots will say, yeah, yeah, fine. You know, so long as I get to do exactly what I, my references are for. So I think that's where the culture is. Uh, the, the, I, I say shock. I say the, the, the friction, my learning a new language while having to deliver on something, basically. One of the approaches we've seen, you know, um, to be, you know, at least, you know, initially successful in all these types of transformative um, initiatives, basically, is, you know, to start very small and to reach out to allies within the silos, reach out to allies within the slabs, and and get together like a team that is, you know, sort of like a the the early adopters true believers to to work together and each becomes like a, a champion from their particular part of the organization or their particular uh component of the organization and and just start experimenting talking collaborating working it's a sisyphean task because every time you roll the rock up the hill you have the impression that it's going to roll down again and maybe <laughs> even flatten you 
but uh, certainly no one function can do it alone. You know, no agile organizational coach can go to uh, an organization into, into doing this. It has to come from the inside and it has to overcome, you know, and it has to unlearn many of the cultural aspects that are already in place. But um, uh, an early cross-functional team of, of enthusiastic early adopters who have courage and uh, passion can can do wonders and eventually eventually they, they create a, a, a you know a pull effect whereby you know people start going well what are they, what are they talking about it's it's kind of interesting yet scary <laughs> one anecdote i can share about about this kind of transition many uh, a few years ago i was working with a pmo and helping them to evolve and it was really a compliance based pmo their goal was to send pre controls in all style within projects to see whether all the deliverables were at each gate and check, check the boxes, okay? And uh, want to become more an enabler type of PMO, which is basically in the right direction toward VMO. And one thing that we discovered uh, really helped people to, be, to change their behavior is metrics, is that the defining what makes this PMO valuable would be how you, you help to deliver, how you help projects to deliver their value. And once you have this kind of metrics, then as, as you know, metrics tend to drive behavior. It's a strong way to drive behavior. So it was not, it was not, it was not a problem of skills or roles or responsibilities. It was just about what defines success for this entity. And although the PMO remained a PMO in terms of uh, a label, it was really evolving in big steps towards what we now call a VMO. In the sense that it really helped the organization become more value oriented. It doesn't mean that a compliance is disappears. It means that compliance is subordinate to deliver value. Because if you were compliant and you don't deliver value, you don't have an organization. Okay. <laughs> so it's basically reordering the different uh, objectives. One of the things, uh, one of the things too, is what we're looking at here is, oh, Jean, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to comment um, on, on, Bruno, on uh, Bruno's uh, statement. Uh, yeah, just just finding the right matrix today is uh, to measure value is the challenge in most cases because people just argue on that's not the right matrix or it's the right matrix, and just getting all or everybody agree on what matrix to use is 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 a, a big challenge. And then going and decide on value is is like the next step. But like uh, there are several obstacles to get there, but uh, obviously it, it's it's the way to go. I'm 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 convinced already. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Even the concept of value itself, um, if you look around and you do some research, there is no single definition of business value. The agile mm -hmm. world hasn't provided one. Even lean hasn't really provided one. There is no single overriding deficient. You know, you can't. There's no dictionary you can flip to, look at the word value, and oh, okay, everyone everyone agrees. Right? It, it differs by industry. It differs by organization. It differs by culture. It differs. Uh, is, is is value custom? You know, is it customer centric? Is it stakeholder centric? Is it shareholders? Is it you know? Obviously, the answer is usually it's it's a bit of everything, and the the you know, the percentages in the mix are usually unique to industries and unique to organizations within those industries. But uh, yeah, to your point, getting to a definition of value and then the right metrics around that is, is a big job in itself. So what I mean by that is single loop learning is when you start with a PMO and you realize that uh, you need to, you know, create checklists and they aren't working quite right and you, you are, are moving between enablement and support and so on. So that's that's a PMO learning as it goes along from immediate feedback from its environment. The second, uh, the second learning loop for PMOs was a couple of years ago, well, several years ago, when we had the concept of the hybrid PMO. So a PMO that could oversee traditional, agile, um, exploratory, lean work, and be able to sort of provide guidance, governance, and support for all three types. Now, this third loop of learning, the VMO, is basically admitting that the entire idea of a PMO 
um, being a centralized sort of enabling function, um, but without authority over, without not not authority, but without the ability to impact and really engage with the other stakeholders, that that idea um, is gone, and that you basically metamorph metamorphize the PMO into a higher level construct, which draws in participants' engagement and resources from the rest of the organization. So you, you, a VMO is, is more than an upgraded PMO, really. It's, it's the result of triple loop thinking around, this is an augmented, uh, different idea. If I may, Daniel, I think there are also some bottom-up uh, criteria that can help move into a VMO. What, I, what I've lived through in this example I mentioned earlier with the metrics is that at some point, and I will be very blunt there, People are just fed up with compliance PMOs. They're fed up people coming with their little uh, police police hats to check the delivery of projects because people are busy delivering values, right? And that's also a factor that can be leveraged to move toward a VMO, saying that look, this compliance approach that dates from 20 years ago, it doesn't work anymore. At least it's not enough in the organization. So it can help really bottom up to say either we change as a PMO. Are we going to disappear? People are just going to ignore us anyway, you know, because you know how it works. The big projects are critical anyway. They will not be compliant. It will be it will be okay. You see, so at some point you have also this kind of bubbling from the base. You know, it's like oh, we, we got to do something because it's it's un it's unsustainable to try to control everything. Mm -hmm.